I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening with lung disease because I think in this serious complication of scleroderma, we're really entering in, in a very exciting time when some really promising treatments are going to become uh, come online. So I just want to give you a little bit of an update of where we are with those. And just as a reminder, we heard a lot about the skin problems and they're certainly very prevalent and very troublesome uh, to deal with. Uh, but of course, the reason why scleroderma is such a serious and sometimes life-threatening disease is because it affects all the internal organs. Um, and because it does, we, we think it's really critical to have an integrated team where the different specialists from the different areas that are involved work closely together and, and integrate their care. I think one of the common problems we see is patients see various specialties, specialists in the community who are very good at what they do but often don't necessarily communicate uh, and integrate their care and so patients get their heart and lung and kidneys treated but not an integrated uh, holistic kind of approach. So we think it's very important to pull that together and you may recognize if you're a patient here, these are some of the different uh, specialists here at Northwestern who work together and each of them is an expert in their own particular areas. So it really takes a village, a group of uh, many different experts with different backgrounds to provide the best integrated care. But having said that, we, we do know that lung complications are very common in scleroderma and really are probably the most currently most serious and potentially most life-threatening complications. So it remains a major uh, major unmet need and a challenge of how to deal with these. <clears throat> and when we talk about lung problems, there's really two very different kind of lung problems. One is, and I'll show you a little bit later, actually affecting the lung tissue itself, and that's often called pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease. And the other one is affecting the circulation in the, in the, in the lungs. So it's a cardiovascular type of problem, and that's called pulmonary hypertension. And later on, Dr. Steen will talk about how to recognize it and, and screen for that complication. Uh, so what I'm gonna cover uh, quickly in the, in the next uh, 20, 30 minutes is why do people with scleroderma get breathing problems? What are the different causes of that? I'm really not gonna talk much about what some of the research is showing about how you get this kind of lung involvement, but just show you some pictures of what happens in the lung as you develop scleroderma involvement. And then focus really on how to and why we screen for the presence of lung involvement. How do we evaluate lung involvement? And then really go through some general guidelines of how we currently treat lung problems in scleroderma and some of the exciting uh, recent advances that are currently happening or will be happening uh, within the next uh, two, three years. So one very important thing to consider, uh, and this is really for uh, both patients and physicians who see uh, maybe at the first encounter people who have scleroderma is that breathlessness and getting short of breath is, does not necessarily mean lung disease. So there are many causes of that. Again, the two uh, prominent lung causes of breathlessness are shown here. So interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis uh, that can cause uh, scarring of the lung essentially uh, and pulmonary hypertension that has different types and you'll hear about uh, later on. But in addition to these problems that affect the lung or the circulation of the lung, there are many things that can cause breathlessness in people who have scleroderma. And this just lists some of them. Very important to remember that, for example, just being deconditioned or having weak muscles, weak diaphragm can cause these problems. Uh, just being anemic from gastrointestinal bleeding can cause problems. Diaphragmatic splinting, if you're got abdominal distension and bloating can impair the ability to breathe. A fluid around the heart or the lung can impair breathing, cardiac problems, uh, pulmonary embolus. So there's a very, very long list of things that can happen to anyone, and certainly people with scleroderma, that can lead to being short of breath. 
So it's very important to keep in mind that if somebody with scleroderma has these symptoms, it, it absolutely does not mean that the lungs are involved and really requires a very thoughtful and detailed approach, both a history, a physical examination, and doing appropriate testing that I'll talk about in a minute. So when you do get interstitial lung disease, so this is uh, one of these major complications of scleroderma, also called pulmonary fibrosis, this is what happens in the lung. Um, <clears throat> this is a normal lung. Let me see if I can do this. No. Um, oh, there. So this is a normal lung. It, it looks like a sponge. The uh, lung is actually filled with these air spaces called alveolar spaces, and that's where the oxygen gets inspired. And then that oxygen has to get into the blood vessels. So this is a blood vessel. And then, of course, the red blood cells pick up the oxygen. It goes through your body, and that's how you maintain normal oxygenation. So it's critically important that these uh, alveolar interstitial spaces are very thin so that the blood, the oxygen can readily get, get into and absorb by the blood and carry it throughout the, uh, the bloodstream. Now compare this <clears throat> normal appearing lung to what happens in some people with scleroderma. And you can see that these very, very thin lines now become markedly thickened. Uh, the blood vessels often completely disappear from here and the whole lung looks distorted and disorganized. And you can easily imagine that in a lung like this, the oxygen that's in here is simply not going to be able to get to where it needs to go, which is to be picked up by the blood vessels. And so ultimately, this causes progressive respiratory failure, <coughs> difficulty breathing, and all the other classic complications uh, that happens in lung fibrosis. Now, this is not unique to scleroderma. There is other forms of lung disease <clears throat> that also get a similar picture, and they all have uh, very serious complications, potentially. <clears throat> so what are the symptoms when you have uh, interstitial lung disease or lung fibrosis? So the most prevalent and classic symptom is shortness of breath. And importantly, many people don't really notice shortness of breath until they exercise. So at rest or minimal activity, you may be perfectly fine, but you notice, for example, typically by going upstairs, that you start being short of breath where you never had those symptoms before. And that's very important to look for, and it's important for physicians to ask for that, because just because someone is not, not having respiratory symptoms at rest does not mean that there is not a uh, already respiratory compromise. Perhaps less commonly, you can get chronic dry cough. <clears throat> less commonly still, but blood in the sputum would be a worrisome sign. <clears throat> and as these things progress, you get progressively more fatigued. Weight loss can occur. And these are all complications of more advanced uh, interstitial lung disease. A very important point is that oftentimes these symptoms don't develop until the disease is fairly advanced. So if someone has interstitial lung disease and are presenting with these kind of symptoms, uh, that's not a good thing because ideally for a number of reasons, we need to catch this process early on before these symptoms uh, occur. So that leads me to talk about screening and evaluation of the lung and why that's, that's important to do in anybody with scleroderma. So we know that Lung disease in scleroderma often has a poor prognosis, and in many people it can be relentlessly progressive and, and is currently still incurable. We also know that if we use treatments, they are much more likely to be effective early on before this irreversible scarring has occurred in the lung. So this all mitigates for the fact that it's, it's imperative that we pick up this lung disease early before these irreversible scarring, damage, changes have occurred. Uh, and yet, as I mentioned, early stage lung disease can be difficult to recognize. And people can actually lose quite a lot of their lung, maybe as much as half of their lung function, before they start having symptoms. So we absolutely cannot depend on just waiting for symptoms to occur uh, in order to diagnose this. So staging and screening becomes very, very important. 
On the other hand, it's also important to keep in mind that just because somebody with scleroderma has lung involvement doesn't mean that they absolutely need to be treated for their complications. If you look very sensitively with a high resolution CAT scan or histology, uh, as much as 80, 90 percent of people with scleroderma will have some evidence of damage in the lung. And yet a lot of these folks don't have any progressive disease and probably do not need to be treated and would not benefit from treating that. It seems that about, about 40 percent of people with scleroderma develop the kind of lung disease that's going to be severe and progressive enough. And the challenge again is to be able to identify those people who have this kind of severe and progressive lung disease. Uh, and again, not everybody needs to be treated. Many people with scleroderma have lung disease that doesn't progress, causes perhaps minimal, mild to moderate damage, and doesn't really get worse over time. So it really becomes very important for us to know what are risk predictors? How can we look at people with scleroderma and identify those who are going to have either develop lung disease or progressive lung disease. <clears throat> and we want to identify those who have mild lung disease who are not going to be progressive. We want to identify those who have stable lung disease. And so we need risk factors that can tell us um, who's going to have progression of the lung involvement. Um, the tools that we use, and we believe these are very important for screening anybody who presents with scleroderma, are primarily uh, high resolution CT scanning, which is a far more sensitive technique than chest x rays. And I think really everybody with early diagnosis should have this as a baseline. And oftentimes it never needs to be repeated, but it's very important to start off with that so that we know what the lungs look like. Um, and then pulmonary function testing, and I'll come back to that. Everyone should have that again to know where we start off at baseline. Now, once we find that there is evidence of lung disease, how do we try to predict whether it's going to be progressive or stable? And there are a number of tools that are uh, looking promising in this regard. So radiologists can look at the high resolution CT and just by looking at the pattern and the extent of involvement have some idea of is this likely to be progressive or not. And there's actually algorithms that tell us that if over 20, 25 percent of the lung shows scarring kind of damage, uh, that often is likely to be progressive. And those are folks that probably should be considered for aggressive treatment. Uh, there's a lot of interest. And if you're at Northwestern, you probably participate in some of our studies. But looking at the blood to see if we can identify proteins that could be simply measured over time to see if you're at high risk for progressive lung disease. <clears throat> and I listed some of these here. Many of these are still research tools, but some are looking promising. Um, and in particular, there's a one called IL-6. It's something we can measure in the blood, and it seems like if you have high levels, you have a, a higher risk of progressive lung disease. This is very useful because, as I'll show you later, we now have a drug that can actually prevent this IL-6 from, from becoming active. There's also a lot of interest in genetics. Uh, in fact, um, it's becoming clear that there are some genetic risk factors, not just for knowing whether you get scleroderma or not, but if you have scleroderma, whether you're likely to develop progressive lung disease or not. And we're also doing re genomic research and that means that we take skin biopsies, and many of you probably have had that. And we're trying to understand if by looking at the genes in your skin, whether we can predict that you're going to have lung involvement or not. And while this is still very much at a research stage, there is some promising data that in the next uh, few years, we'll get more sophisticated to be able to predict that. So again, a lot of these really focus on can we identify those people who need aggressive treatment because they're at high risk for bad lung disease versus those who have really stable lung disease and probably do not need or would not benefit from, from some of these aggressive therapies that I'll show you. And this is how we screen really everybody with scleroderma and, and 
Uh, I think most of us would agree that this is appropriate evaluation. So really everybody should have a pulmonary function study in a high resolution CT, uh, really at initial uh, evaluation. <clears throat> if these are normal, we recommend getting a pulmonary function study repeated on a yearly basis for a period of time. If after a number of years the pulmonary function studies stay very stable and continue to be good, your risk of getting bad lung disease really goes way down and then we can usually cut back on these maybe to every few years. Now what happens if your initial show evaluation actually shows evidence of lung damage? <clears throat> Uh, and th this is where it depends. If it's, if it's very mild lung damage, so limited lung disease as you see up there, <clears throat> what we do is we intensify the monitoring to maybe repeat the pulmonary function study in about three months, three to six months. If during the follow-up period the lung function stayed pretty stable, then it's probably reasonable to continue just fairly conservative, <clears throat> non-aggressive treatment. On the other hand, if the evaluation shows extensive lung disease, so for example, a CT shows extensive damage, we know from data that basically that predicts that the lung is going to get worse. So those are the patients that really we need to make a decision on more aggressive treatment. And that should be started really as soon as, uh, as, as possible. So with that, let me come to treatment. What are the treatment options? And again, for those patients where we're pretty sure that the lung disease is bad or potentially bad or likely to be progressive, where we don't want to wait because we think any further wait will just cause more damage and potentially irreversible damage to the lungs. So just a few general principles, <clears throat> just to highlight what I said. Early diagnosis is important. Accurate diagnosis is important. It's very important to make sure that uh, the lung problems are truly due to lung problem. They're not due to aspiration from reflux, pulmonary hypertension, infections, lung cancer. These all need to be carefully considered and ruled out. Uh, we determine the need for intervention and therapy <clears throat> based on some of the principles that I mentioned to you. Uh, vaccinations are important and really, really important is to make sure that you have a good pulmonologist and you work together, uh, not in isolation. Um, and that's really how you can provide the most up-to-date and most appropriate uh, treatment. So what are the drugs that we currently use? There are really uh, three drugs that are fairly commonly used for, <clears throat> for active or aggressive lung disease currently. Probably the most commonly used is cyclophosphamide. This can be given by mouth or by intermittent IV injections. Usually when it's given IV, it's given for six or sometimes 12 months, and then it's followed by what's called maintenance therapy. And I'll show you a little bit of data of why this actually may be effective. Uh, another drug that's actually fairly commonly used, but until very recently we didn't have hardcore data that it works is mycophenolate or salcept, uh, but we now have a clinical trial that is, the data will just be presented publicly um, in a few weeks, but I'll show you some of the parts of the data that show that it may be effective. And then there's a drug called rituximab that's been uh, uh, extensively used in other diseases, in autoimmune diseases and malignancies. It's uh, it's a good drug, it's reasonably safe, and it seems to have efficacy in scleroderma lung disease, but there's no randomized controlled studies, and so it's really not officially approved, at least as of now, for this indication, which doesn't mean that we cannot use it, but it's more difficult to, <clears throat> to, to get covered by the insurance. So cyclophosphamide is really a chemotherapy, it's an alkylating agent, it's being used in lymphomas and leukemias, it can be given uh, by monthly intravenous infusion. It's, it's fairly well tolerated. It can be given by mouth, but it does have side effects. So nausea is common. Bladder problems are common, and unfortunately, one concern is the, is the risk, an increased risk of late malignancies, including even hematological <clears throat> and bladder cancer. So this is obviously a concern. This is a drug that's not to be uh, used lightly. <clears throat> 
And this is a study that was done, uh, Dr. Steen and myself and others participated in <coughs> a number of years ago uh, that really showed that this drug actually may work. Um, okay, I'll just show it here. And, and in this study, basically patients were random, patients with early lung disease were randomized to get either cytoxan or placebo and then followed over time. And what you see here is that in this particular case, patients started off with fairly bad lung function. And in the placebo group, they didn't really get worse, but, but they remained relatively stable, certainly did not get better. In the cyclophosphamide group, there's actually an improvement. Um, it was a modest improvement, not dramatic, but it was significant. However, once the drug was stopped, the improvement actually went away. And after a period of time, the patients who got cytoxan uh, really ended up the same as placebo. So it showed a modest benefit, very transient benefit, and the risk of side effects. So it was an advancement, but not a, not a really dramatic breakthrough in this treatment. <clears throat> So let me now switch on to uh, where we are currently and what's happening and what are some of the exciting new developments. Uh, and again, I, I, I would just say that uh, in terms of treating lung disease, we really are at a very exciting era. In particular, there are now two drugs that I'll mention to you that were approved. These are the first drugs ever approved for pulmonary fibrosis. And, and while these drugs are really not, again, uh, the, the magical cure, they are definitely a major step in the right direction. And again, it's the first drugs that were ever approved uh, for treating uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So one drug that's been used for many, many years is mycophenolate or Celsept. It's an immunosuppressive drug. It's been used for a very long time, for example, for preventing renal transplant rejection. It's relatively safe. Uh, definitely should not be used during pregnancy. The complications of this treatment are relatively minor and they are very predictable, typical of any immunosuppressive drug. <coughs> so uh, increased risk of infections, uh, skin cancers, lymphomas, these are very, very rare, but they are real complications that must be watched for. The most common complication of cell is actually gastrointestinal, so nausea, upset stomach, diarrhea are actually quite frequent, uh, generally well tolerated, and patients most of the time actually uh, learn to uh, live with these complications. But do we know if this study, if this drug actually works? So this is a study that again was just completed and the results will be presented shortly. It's called SLS2 scleroderma lung study 2. Now in this study, instead of comparing a drug to placebo, since we already knew that cy cytoxan may be effective, in this study we compared cytoxan to Celsept or mycophenolate. <coughs> uh, and in this study, again, patients with early stage scleroderma who already had evidence of lung involvement were recruited. And patients either got cytoxan uh, for 12 months or mycophenolate or Celsept for 24 months. And then they were followed for respiratory symptoms, but pulmonary function testing, CAT scanning, and of course, carefully looking at safety of the study. So what did the results show? Uh, this is one simple way of presenting the data. And essentially what this shows is what happened to pulmonary function uh, at, I believe it's at one year to these patients. Um, anything above this line shows improvement. <clears throat> so. Uh, these are patients who showed a modest improvement. These are patients who showed a fairly significant improvement. But essentially, the, the bottom line is that what you see is that most patients actually showed improvement. And it turns out that patients who got the CELSEP showed even greater improvement than the patients who got the cyclophosphamide. Now, in both groups, some patients actually did not respond. And that is a very... Uh, important area of research to understand why it is that some patients or even many patients respond to a particular drug and others don't and is there genetic or other underlying causes to uh, explain responders or non-responders. But again, the key is this is the good news that the majority of patients in both groups actually not only remain stable 
but actually showed an improvement in their lung function. And that's really um, uh, quite unprecedented because almost all lung studies until recently showed that at best drugs could stabilize lung disease but not improve it. So <clears throat> this is clearly heading in the right direction now with these treatments. There are side effects and this is actually a, a long list of the many uh, side effects that occur. Most of these are fortunately not severe. <clears throat> the most common side effects would be, as, as you would expect again, are infections. These are typically minor infections like bladder infections or sinusitis and upper respiratory tract infections uh, and gastrointestinal infections, as I mentioned, that are particularly common with CELSEP. Uh, one thing that is of concern is what I bracketed in red, which is hematological complications. And there, exactly as we would expect, the uh, patients who got, who got cyclophosphamide, uh, which is a chemotherapy, we're much more likely to get hematologic complications. So it's one of the reasons why we might ultimately back away from using this drug altogether and use drugs that are at least as effective and safer, such as mycophenolate. Uh, there's also a survival benefit. Uh, so these, this is uh, survival up to uh, about two years. And this is patients who got, um, the colors are actually mixed up, but this is patients who got the cell set uh, and, and the survival was a little bit better than patients who got cyclophosphamide. This is not a sig statistically significant difference, so I just want to show the data, but we don't want to attach too much uh, weight to this because it's, a, it's, again, not a significant difference. But the bottom line is that this is a well done randomized controlled study that clearly demonstrates that both of these drugs were actually beneficial and that mycophenolate was actually more rapid, it had less side effects, and possibly more effective. So that might perhaps become our first drug of choice going forward. Another drug that's being fairly commonly used, particularly in patients who fail CELSEPT or cyclophosphamide is rituximab. <clears throat> this is a, an antibody that targets the B cells Again, it's a drug that's being used in a lot of diseases, quite effective. There are risks of infection, particularly reactivation of hepatitis B, but nevertheless, under well-monitored condition, this is fairly well tolerated. It's an easy drug to administer in the sense that you come in basically twice a year to get an IV infusion, and then the drug is effective for many months after that. Um, the, the difficulty perhaps with the drug is that because it's not approved for scleroderma, insurance companies typically almost routinely uh, reject these claims, although sometimes we're successful in, in getting an appeal for that. So let me just switch in the last, <clears throat> last couple of minutes to what's, what's on the horizon uh, and over the horizon, but this is coming very quickly. I think we're going to see um, tremendous progress and advances uh, within the next two, three years. So scleroderma lung disease is really a fibrosis of the lung. And until recently, even to talk about the idea of antifibrotic treatments was uh, a, you couldn't say that because there is no drugs that could do that. Well, uh, just, uh, just about a year ago, actually, <clears throat> two drugs were uh, essentially approved by the FDA based on very solid clinical trials. They're called pyrfenidone and nintetinib, a very difficult name, or OFEV is the uh, more uh, commercial name for this drug. And I'll tell you a little bit about those. Uh, I'll show you what their efficacy is. And of course, it's very important to keep in mind that these are phenomenally expensive drugs. All of these drugs tend to run around $100,000 a year. So without getting approval and insurance coverage, this is probably really a no-go uh, for most people. Uh, but in addition to these two drugs that were recently approved, uh, there's a number of very promising new targets. Uh, and those are shown in red, and I'll just mention a few of them as we go along. Many of these are now in clinical trials, or they're being used for other uh, rheumatic diseases and are showing reasonable safety and reasonable efficacy. So these are very hopeful. And then there's a number of other drugs under development that are not in clinical trial yet that also look very promising. 
So perfenidone, uh, again, a drug that was approved exactly a year ago in the lung community of doctors. This was considered to be a real milestone, the first drug ever approved and shown to be effective for lung fibrosis. <clears throat> What's really, really interesting is that if you look at the history of this drug, this drug has been around for a very, very long time and studies back even in the 1990s or even earlier already showed that the drug might be effective certainly in mouse models and rats and even in some very small clinical studies which kind of shows that unfortunately how difficult it is to go from the basic research into clinical approval. Uh, this is a process that takes literally billions of, billions of dollars uh, and sometimes even decades. We hope to really make an impact on this process because it's just too slow and cumbersome. Uh, but this drug is, is easy to take. It's oral, generally well tolerated, has a lot of GI side effects. There's also a skin rash with it that's not disabling but is a problem. And of course, the cost is, is really uh, quite high. Uh, the other drug is Nintetinib um, that was again approved just about a year ago. And both of these drugs were approved based on clinical trials in large groups of patients in every case showing that at the very least they seem to slow the progression of lung disease. And that usually means progression of the decline in your lung function measured by pulmonary function testing. <clears throat> so what's next with these two drugs? Um, they are approved. However, important to keep in mind, we don't officially know yet whether they are effective in scleroderma. So just because they are effective in other lung diseases doesn't necessarily mean that they are effective in scleroderma. We actually did complete a small study with perfenidone, and at least we know that it's safe in scleroderma, uh, and hopefully there will be a larger study very soon that will tell us for sure. But until we know that, it's very difficult to use that, and insurance companies probably will not uh, give the green light um, uh, for scleroderma. For the other drug, the intended, the same story, we're about to start a large clinical trial specifically looking at lung disease in scleroderma uh, and, and hope that within maybe two years, maybe less, we'll have definitive data so that we'll be able to start using these drugs. Nobody knows how long these drugs should be used for. Um, should we give a, an induction phase and then back off or do people have to stay in it very long periods of time? These are questions we don't know. And another exciting area is that perhaps these drugs could be used in combination. <clears throat> One of the nice things is that these two effective drugs work by completely different mechanism, meaning that at least from an efficacy point of view, it might make sense to use both together, although whether that's going to be safe or not will have to be looked at very carefully. Uh, and I think just finally, a another drug that's very interesting is tocilizumab. <clears throat> this is a drug that's been around for a number of years and shown to be very effective for other rheumatic diseases, in including rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it blocks IL-6 signaling, and I showed you that IL-6 is, is potentially a bad player in this disease, and high levels in the blood actually tell us that the lung disease is likely to be progressive. So this drug actually blocks the action of this IL-6, it's another immunosuppressive, so the kind of complications you can get, uh, again, are rare, but are a real risk, and they're similar to all the other drugs that we mentioned. Uh, and this drug was recently approved as a weekly subcutaneous injection, actually very easy to take. You can, you can do the injections at home uh, very safely. Uh, and this is the study, uh, I'll just skip this. Skip. This is the results from the tocilizumab study uh, in terms of lung involvement. Uh, you can see it's not quite as impressive as the mycophenolate data <coughs> that I just showed you, but still shows that compared to placebo, uh, in the placebo group in this particular study, there was an average decline in lung function during the course of the study. So patients actually got a little bit worse. In the tocilizumab, this decline was negligible. So at the very least, we know that this drug seems to stabilize the progression of lung involvement, which is good. It's not perfect, but it's better than progressive lung disease. <clears throat>
Uh, and just finally, a few words about what else we can do. Organ transplantation and bone marrow transplantation are real possibilities out there. <clears throat> uh, lung transplantation is obviously a very major undertaking. Uh, lung availability and organ availability is a major issue. This is a major, major surgery. But nevertheless, it is being done for scleroderma, for the right kind of patients, patients who are sick enough in terms of lung, but otherwise in, re in relatively good health that they can survive and recover from this rather large surgery. And this is just data um, from a national survey just a few months ago. Uh, and these are the patients in scleroderma looking at, um, this is actually just one year survival, but basically showing that these patients with scleroderma don't really do much worse or any worse than other people who get lung transplantation for other causes like pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary fibrosis, meaning that the right kind of patients with scleroderma, if they have severe enough lung disease that has not responded to current therapies, uh, lung transplantation is, is an option. And here at Northwestern, we just established a lung transplant program about a year ago. And we're very, very much interested in optimizing the, the whole procedure, particularly for people with scleroderma, so that we can, we can improve survivals and eliminate uh, any early mortality as much as possible. <clears throat> and finally, a word about autologous uh, stem cell therapy or bone marrow transplantation. And, and this is a procedure where essentially uh, we take the patient's blood, uh, to some extent purify it, uh, the patient gets aggressive chemotherapy to get rid of their own uh, immune system, essentially, and then their own blood or stem cells are reinfused to reconstitute uh, the native immune system. It's been a, a controversial procedure for many years because there are significant risks. In many of the early studies, there are significant mortality. Uh, patients got very sick and, and some died from the procedure itself. Uh, but over time and, and understanding better who are good candidates and who are not, the safety has improved considerably, although there's still significant uh, morbidity, significant complications and occasional deaths from the procedure itself. Uh, my colleague Richard Burt here does a very large number of stem cell therapy procedures, not just for scleroderma, but for many autoimmune diseases. And this is some data that he showed uh, about two years ago. Um, now this is a very selected and small group of patients, but in this study he was able to show that uh, patients who got standard therapy such as cytoxan um, actually, uh, this is not, oh there we go, uh, actually seemed to get a little bit worse over time, whereas patients who got the bone marrow transplant uh, showed an early improvement and that remained sustained. So encouraging results, there are somewhat similar results from a large European study, but again, certainly not everybody by any stretch of the imagination is a good candidate for that, and there are significant downsides uh, for this. So any patient who's referred to us for potential bone marrow transplant undergoes a very, very rigorous evaluation, and only if the team here feels that they are really good candidates and likely to benefit significantly from the procedure will we go ahead. Again, this is not an approved treatment. It's very expensive, so insurance coverage is always a major issue here. So let me just end here. Uh, some of the major take-home points. <clears throat> we know that lung complications is one of the major complications in scleroderma. It develops in as much as 60% of patients. Uh, but we know that not everybody with lung disease gets severe or progressive disease. It's very important to discover this early, to screen for this, to make a very accurate diagnosis and not treat patients for another form of or another type of breathlessness that may come from a different source. Uh, and again, the lungs can be affected in multiple ways and it really takes a good thorough workup involving a pulmonologist to be sure that we've ruled out pulmonary hypertension and other forms of lung involvement. Currently, as of now, cyclophosphamide and typically mycophenolate seem to be the leading drugs of choice, but this is a very rapidly moving field uh, and based on these very promising data, 
uh, and results from small studies and studies in other forms of lung disease, uh, I think we can be very optimistic that we'll see some very significant advances. And finally, I think it's really important that anybody with scleroderma lung disease be part of a team evaluation that involves uh, pulmonologists, cardiologists, all the appropriate specialists with expertise in the most recent available diagnostic and treatment options affecting the lung and other organs, and frequent communication and, and integration of care. And then you can also see the importance of clinical trial participation because we can have all these promising treatments, but unless we're able to actually study them in the right condition, which is called a randomized clinical trial, we will never be able to really tell if the drug is truly effective and safe or not. So with all these uh, promising treatments coming on board, we're always looking to enroll the right kind of patients in the right kind of studies, ideally studies where everybody gets some form of treatment. So drug A versus drug B. Um, but so I think the future here looks very promising. So with that, I'll end and, and happy to answer any questions you may have.